Cardenal Cisneros. My talk today uh, is on the sense of movement and the sense of reality. Uh, and this talk will be quite general, and I want to use it to illustrate a methodology in the history of psychology, a way of thinking in the history of psychology, which I and others have promoted. Uh, and it follows from the need that we have within our, our field, the history of psychology, to bring some kind of order to a, a domain of inquiry, which is vast and diverse and doesn't have boundaries. There have been various ways in which people have, have made it possible to bring some kind of order to the history of psychology. Textbook version is one and so on. But I uh, and others have, uh, have tried to do justice uh, to uh, the in intrinsic diversity of the field, the, the huge range of possible topics uh, in, in a number of ways. And, and I've written about this diversity and the problems it creates for historians of psychology in a introduction to a new multi-volume uh, Palgrave handbook of the history of the human in which I've edited a volume on psychology and the title of my introduction is psychology its diverse histories and here I argue that simply if psychology is many things and I take it to be an empirical fact that it is many things. If psychology is many things, then its history also is many things. This uh, means that there are going to be, and this is very exciting, really, very interesting, going to be diverse approaches in the history of psychology, arguing with each other about what they each can contribute. And I see that diversity as a strength, not as a weakness. And my contribution has been to, uh, and, and I continue it in this talk, is to talk about the history of words as the history of concepts or categories, as a way to understand the different forms of knowledge that psychologists have promoted and what the strengths and weaknesses of those different forms of knowledge are. And here are some examples that argue similarly. First of all, Kurt Danziger's wonderful classic study, Marking the Mind, a history of memory, around the notion, the concept of memory. I myself contributed a book around the concept of inhibition. And there's also a recent book by Chris Goody called Development. Uh, and it's a history of the concept of development in which he treats development not as something uh, given in nature, but as a human, uh, uh, a, a human way of ordering the world. Uh, and and many of these approaches have been uh, included within Lorraine Daston's notion of the biography of scientific objects, that the, the, the terms and the material objects and the practices of science can be the subject of, of a history which relates people to their way of life. And that this, this um, conception of biography is applicable within science, not just to people, but to ideas and objects. And in the work that I follow, I've applied this idea of writing biography to concepts. So this is my uh, approach. And today what I want to talk about is the concept of a sense or the senses and the notion of something making sense. This is a very complex word in the English language sense. 
Uh, and I think there is little to be gained from seeking formal definition of these words. What, and that fact that these words are so complex makes a historical approach of central interest. What do we mean by words like a sense, the senses, making sense? And the answer is that we mean what over historical traditions, these words have come to mean. Uh, and the idea of explaining these words or talking about them, their meaning without reference to history would seem to be to be absolutely uh, poverty stricken, absolutely uh, negative. Just to give an example, ask yourself how many senses are there? And how do we separate the senses one from another? Traditionally, of course, in Western culture, there are the five senses, taste, smell, sight, hearing, and touch. Senses are not, are neither completely separate. Sight involves reference to touch senses, uh, Taste and smell clearly are closely related. So, so there's a problem of what is called individuation, specifying the separate nature of the senses. And then there's a problem of how many are there? And what is the relation between a sense and a feeling? And just to illustrate in English, how many senses there are, I list a few different kinds of senses. There is a sense of justice, a sense of balance. There are the bodily senses, the senses of pain and pleasure. There's a sense of self and there's common sense. So, so, so are, these, are, are these not senses? Is there a, a literal meaning of the word sense, and are all the other usages metaphorical? These are the questions that interest me. And then on top of this, and I'm not going to talk about this, what is the relation of these senses to the whole notion of making sense, that is of establishing meaning? And clearly that the word sense is used about the sensory organs and psychological processes and to the process of meaning creation is, is a very deep question, but I'm not going to go into that. There are surely reasons why we say making sense in English. Now, what I want to talk about in particular is the relation between uh, the sense of touch and movement and the sense of reality. There is, it's very common in English to talk about somebody having a sense of reality or a sense of unreality. This is normal descriptive term. And I think there are reasons for this, uh, which are very interesting to psychologists. There is a long tradition in the West, and not only in the West, but not, I don't want to say it's universal, but there is a long tradition associating touch and movement with judgment about what is real. What we can touch is real. What we're coming into contact is real. And the most famous reference to this is that of St. Thomas in the Gospels. And if you recall that St. Thomas was the disciple of Christ, who after Christ's resurrection and Christ's return, St. Thomas said when he saw the figure of Christ, he says, unless I can place my hands on the wounds of Christ, I do not believe. And Christ invited Thomas to place his hands on his wounds. That is, that the touch of the hands 
was the confirmation of the reality of the resurrection of Christ. Another famous example of this relationship is in, 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 in British culture, is that of Dr. Samuel Johnson, who in the, many of you will know this, it's about 1770. Johnson uh, was asked one day, well, well, what's wrong with Barclay's theory, idealistic theory of reality? You know, what, how can we know that anything exists uh, materially? And Johnson's answer was to kick a large stone. That is, instead of arguing with words, he moved, this is important for me, he moved by kicking, physically kicking a stone and said, look, it exists. And this is common sense in English, that it is by this kind of contact that one knows that something exists. And, and you will see the, the, the importance of this in relation to our recent experiences with COVID and Zoom and digital relations is that this form of relationship with objects, the reality, has been taken away, the touch relationship has been removed. And it's this that calls into question much of, of, of current thinking about relation between what is real and what is not real. But what I'm pointing about is the long background to this in thought about touch. And this long background, it is also evident in English in a whole series of figures of speech. And I guess you will have them in Spanish, but I, I'm, I apologize, I'm ignorant. In English, you say to grasp reality, that is to, to really know something, you grasp it. Uh, to be moved is to be emotionally changed by somebody, to be moved, or to make contact. We say this all the time, let's make contact, uh, meaning, literally to contact, to come into tactual relationship with somebody. And metaphorically, we are now talking, we're in contact with each other, but clearly we're in contact metaphorically in, in relation to the traditional usages of the word contact. To be, and we are in touch, we say, are we in touch now? Yes, we're in touch, uh, but what does that mean? And there are many, many other of these expressions. You talk about socially to move up in the world. You talk also, for example, about a political movement. Let's join a political movement to campaign against something. So the, the metaphors of touch and movement are embedded in the language about what is real and what our relationship is with what is real. And as I say, this has a very relevant contemporary uh, dimension because of the impact of digital technologies and the boost that's been given to those technologies in conditions of isolation uh, during the pandemic. Now, the topic that I want particularly to talk about is a sense of subjective self-movement. I'm not talking about our perception of moving objects in the world, but our perception of ourselves as movers. This is, uh, that is, I'm talking about uh, uh, what is described as kinesthesia, conscious movement. And what I want to point out, and I'm not going to go into this, but I want to point out that this Phenomenally, if you reflect on your subjective awareness of movement, this reflection, the phenomenology of this, is that it shows that there is a double component to movement. It involves both action and resistance. But movement is a double phenomenon. It comes, so to speak, in in a, as a couple, as a doubled form 
involving action or resistance. And this is in certain important respects, part of the background to the whole notion of the dialectic. Now, in talking about this topic of movement, we have to deal with three very widely used terms, which you will know, kinesthesia, proprioception, and haptic sense. And it's interesting that there is no standard or cons consistent usage of these terms. And I think that's because the movement is movement of people or of persons, not, it's not movement of mind, and hence it's not a psych psychological event only. And it's not only a material event, movement of bodies. Movement is about people and the language which I've been talking about, about grasping things or coming into contact or moving up in the world is movement about people, not about minds or bodies. And our feeling of our own movement ranges on a spectrum from conscious when it is called kinesthesia through to unconscious when it is understood as proprioception. And basically kinesthesia is a psychological term uh, about, the, the, about, the, about perception or consciousness. And proprioception is a physiological term about the sensory systems of the body that reg register the position uh, and movement of uh, the different parts of the body. And the haptic sense is a general term to, to suggest that when we think about the senses in general, they include a reference to touch. So haptic sense is a signal that we are conscious that, that, that there is going to be discussion or implicit uh, discussion of the role of touch and movement in sensory activity, particularly vision. Now, the, among contemporary psychologists, the topic of kinesthesia is especially researched under the theories of motor control. These are, as, as some of you will surely know, uh, areas of huge contemporary interest, enormously sophisticated research. And this interest in motor control and what the role of the sense of movement is in motor control is, is, is centrally tied up with major industries concerned with prosthetics and robotics. So it's an area of huge investment. At the same time, there is a huge cultural interest in movement. And this centers on contemporary culture's fascination, preoccupation with embodiment, with ways of life which recognize the centrality of the body uh, in, in in, in our relations, in uh, our well-being, in health, uh, and, 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 in the, in, and in the arts. And I'm going to come back to this notion of in embodiment. And I add a personal interest here. I personally am interested uh, because I'm involved with both walking and modern dance. And I'm interested in the question, why does movement matter to people? Why dance? Why dance? Now, to, to talk about these questions, I've published a book, uh, The Sense of Movement and Intellectual History. Um, and I've published two, two articles, one in the Review of General Psychology on kinesthesia, in which I argue it's at the center of our feeling for relations. And by relations, I mean both relations between people and relations between ourselves and the world around us. Uh, and then I've also publishing in a, in a, a research encyclopedia uh, on human movement and dance. Okay. <clears throat> 
So let me say a little about the um, historical background to the sense of movement. Just so some of you will, I, I, I'm sure, know about this, but um, not everybody does. There is this Western tradition of the five senses, since at least since Aristotle. But even though discussion over the centuries has been about these five senses, uh, it has always been understood that touch is in some sense distinctive. It's different because it's not localized in the body uh, and because touch seems to enter into relations with the other senses. And along with this, there is an ultral emphasis upon sight being noble and objective and touch being basic and subjective. And the whole series of dualities to do with male, female, high and low in culture and so on is is therefore tied up with the um, metaphorical use of the differences of touch from the other senses. <clears throat> there is also from ancient times uh, reference to the common sense, uh, a sense which is necessary to integrate or to coordinate, to create a common perception out of the different senses. And this is a subject of a very fine intellectual history by Daniel Heller-Roas, The Inner Touch. Also anciently were recognized the bodily senses, sometimes called coenesthesia. Uh, that, that is the sense of, you know, of, of, of breathing of the stomach, uh, all the, all the, all the, um, the, inchoate or the imprecise senses that come with us all the time about aches and pains, uh, the sense that we have a body. And this has particularly been studied by the Swiss and historian of culture, Jean Starobinsky. And there also since ancient times, occasional references to the sixth sense, a sense beyond the the standard fire. And this has generally, interestingly, been associated with intuition or with the notion that we have a sense that goes beyond what the ordinary five senses tell us about the world. And if you Google now, you will come up, up against a, a Hollywood film about a boy who can talk with the dead. That is his sixth sense, his inability to communicate with the dead. Uh, and extrasensory perception is sometimes called a sixth sense. But interestingly, so is the sense of movement, has also been called a sense. But a sense of movement is associated with intuition, something deep, something that goes beyond the ordinary five senses. There are now quite a substantial rich body of writing about the cultural history of the senses, including on touch, such as uh, Constance Classen's book on the deep sense, uh, David Parisi's book on archaeologists of touch. And it's interesting that this literature about the history of touch, uh, its culture and psychology, expresses a feeling of recovery which is about our own times, that we are in an age which has recovered the body, which has recovered uh, the sense of touch that the body has. Uh, and that this is sometimes associated with the ocular centric culture, which is supposed to have overemphasized uh, the observer's difference from the object. Whereas, our contemporary interest in touch is that it relates us with objects. It, it demonstrates uh, the intimacy of, of our place. And what I want to emphasize that all this literature on touch doesn't do justice to the fact that touch involves movement. That is, whenever you touch, 
you also have a sense of movement. And it's this contribution of the sense of movement to touch that I try to emphasize in, in, in my work. And the, following in part a study by Maxine Sheets Johnston, who similarly argues for the primacy of movement in our sensory world. And this claim that there's some sense of primacy is seen as innovative in the literature. Now, let me just illustrate the role of movement with what I take is a familiar uh, painting to you all, as it's in the Prado in Madrid. This is the famous um, allegory of touch. This is painting that allegorizes touch, uh, painted in the early 17th century by Jan Bruegel uh, and Peter Paul Rubens. And what it is about is clearly the contrast between the cold, still metal and the warm, moving flesh. And the contrast is, is obviously about male and female, but many other things. The painting's very rich. But what I want to emphasize is that this, the figure of Venus, uh, the slightly to the center of the picture, the uh, figure of naked Venus, uh, she is moving. The figure is turning in order to embrace Cupid. And the contrast there is with the armor, which is sitting still. That is, Venus is alive uh, and the armor is dead. And it's also interesting that Venus is sitting with bare feet on a soft carpet. That is, that she's in touch uh, through her feet with gentleness and warmth. But my, my main point is that this picture is, is obviously about the contrasts between male and female uh, and softness and hardness and so on. But it's also about the difference between movement and stillness. Now, <clears throat> the, there are no specific reference references to the sense of movement separate from touch before the late 18th century, but then there are. And discussion about a separate sense of movement uh, begins in medical literature on the bodily senses. Uh, there is, a, a, as you will know, a very large medical literature about the nature of life at the end of the 18th century. Uh, what are the forces that differ, differentiate living things from non-living things? And in the context there, as in the work of Erasmus Darwin, Charles Darwin's grandfather, you find reference to a, a sense in the muscles, a, an aware, a, a kind of awareness in the muscles that uh, of uh, whether they are active or stretched. Um, and the second literature where the discussion of, of what comes to be called a muscular sense occurs is in analysis of the senses, especially of touch's contribution to vision. Now, through the 18th century, since Berkeley, it, the role of touch in vision was talked about, and it was understood that touch is central to the acquisition of depth perception in, in, in vision. And that analysis of the role of touch in depth perception leads to the differentiation of the muscles and particularly the moving muscles of the eyeballs uh, in contributing to vision. And that puts on the agenda of discussion, uh, uh, knowledge, claims about knowledge of a muscular sense. And it's important to note, I'm not going to go into this, but to note that people didn't, didn't distinguish between questions about knowledge of reality, that is philosophical questions in modern terms, and psychological questions about 
how we acquire knowledge of reality. And so that when they're talking about touch in the muscular sense, they are at the same time talking psychologically about how we have perceptions and they're talking philosophically about what those perceptions say about reality. There's not a division between the psychological and the philosophical kinds of claims. So by about 1810, there are references to a muscular sense. In German, a muskelsinn, you find in J.J. Engel and J.C. Steinbuch. Uh, Steinbuch, followed by Johannes Müller, uh, develop a, a, a major research area concerned with the relationship between the movement uh, of the eye muscles uh, and perception, depth perception, perception of space. In English writing, there is the work, most importantly, of Charles Bell, who in lectures to medical students in 1816, introduced the idea of a muscular sense. And he introduced it in the context of interest in the nervous control of movements and of locomotion. And he argued that there is a circle of nerves that uh, the, an, action, a, 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 an action of will causes a movement of a limb, causes muscles to alter, and the muscles then record the alteration through a sense, and that sense then informs the brain, so that you have a circle between brain and muscles, back from muscles to brain, and that such a circle is central to motor control. And that, of course, is now seen as the foundations of modern understandings of motor control. But he referred to a muscular sense, uh, and he interestingly called it a sixth sense. There is, he said, a sixth sense more important than all the others. And this was followed by recognition in the literature in English by Thomas Brown, James Mill and others that touch is divisible between contact and muscular sense. And there began to be separate discussion of the much muscular sense. At the same time as the medical literature in Germany, uh, Britain, uh, and, and Bell's work, there is a discussion by the French ideologues uh, at the end of the 18th century, which greatly uh, focused upon touch and emphasized that it is the first and primary sense. Uh, and in, the, in a figure like Cabanis, um, who, who linked mind and body in an integrated picture of the sensible life of, of living things. He said, touch is the first sense to develop, the last which is extinguished. This is as it must be, since it is the base of the other, since it is, as it were, sensibility itself. And that notion of sensibility itself is extended from contact touch to muscular sensibility. And uh, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but uh, in the work of the ideologue Destut Tracy following Condiac, there was an analysis of the sense of action uh, encountering resistance uh, as the basis of touch. The property of resistance, he said, to our will to move is us at the base of all that we learn to know. That is, the senses through which we feel resistance are turned in this literature of, of the uh, ideologues into a claim about what is fundamental 
in our perceptual world and what is fundamental is in the is in the musculature or the position of the joints and the work of Maine de Biran is very important here he himself was not belonged to the ideologists but he he was deeply uh, he, he read deeply in that literature and Mendebira emphasized the exercise of activity, an act of will, precedes what follows, resistance. And that it is the two together, action and resistance, that are at the basis of the idea that we have a self. That is the very notion of what it is to be a person in Biran's analysis originates with the double phenomenal quality of the consciousness of action versus resistance, which, uh, which others were to translate into the muscular sense, Mendebiran and others. That is the notion of I am begins with the with action and the sensory consequences of the action known in resistance that is reality in this literature is known in action resistance that is as a relation and this is very important and continues to be a very important kind of argument because it offers an alternative to the Cartesian image of ourselves being observers looking out on an external world. The action resistance analysis is an analysis of a relationship. And that is opposed, it offers a whole discourse of contrast to the Cartesian discourse of our being minds in bodies and through the minds being brought into relationship to the body, bring contact to the world. And, and so that, that here there is the basis really for a different metaphysics, a different uh, basis for understanding the human relationship with nature. And that, that uh, I, I followed this out in my book, uh, to, and uh, uh, you can see man, many consequences of this argument in modern French uh, philosophical thinking, particularly in the work of Deleuze. Now, within this argument that Maine de Biram was making, there was an ambivalence that continues, and this continues to be central to the philosophical debate about these arguments. And that is, is the self given in the awareness of action? Does it come when we act? Or is the self a construct resulting from differentiation of action and resistance? And, and even Main de Biran at different places articulates both answers to this question. Is somehow or other when we will is a self given or uh, do we only differentiate, differentiate the self as a result of acting and then encountering resistance? And you, this debate continues in modern uh, discussions. Now, through the 19th century, the muscular sense becomes a generally accepted part of research. It is an established area of inquiry. Um, and debate is about whether the sense the, uh, is peripheral, that is, in the, comes from the muscles, or whether there is also a sense, so to speak, in the brain when uh, there is a decision to take an action. Is there then a feeling of innovation going to the muscles? Is there a feeling accompanying uh, impulses from the center to the periphery, or is there only a feeling which comes from? The periphery telling the center 
about what the state of the muscles and joints is. The, because of uh, ignorance about the brain, clinical medical evidence is very important to the arguments and people repeatedly report a medical case that you can find in Bell, just to give an illustration of people's understanding. Um, Bell reported the case of a woman who could hold her baby in her arm while she looked at the baby. But if she looked away from the baby, she dropped the baby. That is, her sight was necessary to know what she was doing with her arm. And this is a, is, is a recognized syndrome in which there is a loss, we would say, of proprioceptive information from the arm, uh, meaning that the, a person is unable to do certain things without actually seeing what they are doing. And it's this kind of case that was much discussed. Uh, and everybody can easily understand this, this kind of incident. The word kinesthesia was introduced into the debate in 1880 uh, by a London medical specialist on the brain, H. Charlton Bastian. It became, people became aware that it was very difficult to experiment on the muscular sense and hence, and hence resolve debate about whether it was central or peripheral. And, and this has affected psychologists in the 20th century very much because how do you control for embodied variables? If you wish to study the muscular sense, how do you isolate it? Given that it's intrinsic to the whole activity of the body. And that is, is made experimentation extremely demanding in this area. Uh, and it discouraged in the 20th century, many psychologists from studying the sense, because unlike vision, you can't isolate the variables involved. But there were persuasive experiments by a, a German researcher, um, Alfred Goldscheider in the 1880s, in which he manipulated the joints of the fingers, very precise controlled experimental work with manipulating, manipulating the joints of the fingers. Uh, and this encouraged the view that sense is peripheral. So that by 1900, most researchers are accepting the peripheral nature of the muscular sense. At the same time, the professions of physiology and psychology were being in many ways pushed apart because of specialization in each area. Uh, and in this context, the word kinesthesia was taken up by psychologists. And the word proprioception introduced by Sherrington in 1906 uh, was taken up by physiologists. And the physiologists focused on the reflex control of movement, whereas the psychologists uh, for the first two decades of the 20th century, especially American psychologists, focused on motor theories of cognition using the concept of kinesthesia. Cons uh, of kinesthesia. Through the 20th century, the, uh, the specialization uh, creates subdisciplines for the study of individuated senses of vision uh, and, and of hearing in particular. But the connection of vision and touch was always apparent. And it became central again, really, with the work of J.J. Gibson uh, in the 1960s. And, and Gibson re referred to the haptic uh, sensory, haptic sensory system. Starting with vision, he found that he couldn't understand vision without also understanding uh, touch. <laughs> 
and specialist subdiscipline of motor control uh, emerge with cybernetics uh, and with the work, for example, of the Russian physiologist Nikolai Bernstein uh, in the 1960s. And, and modern researchers on motor control trace their work back to this, see their special speciality that's originated in this period. Right. No. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to say a little about embodiment. And I moving to the cultural dimensions of, of my study. Now, science, as, as we all know, has been transformed from the 1980s with the integration of artificial intelligence research, psychology, and brain science. Uh, and it's also been transformed by the development of relations between phenomenolo phenomenology and psychology in theories of action. Uh, and the outcome is the development of embodied cognitive psychology. And as Alf, uh, uh, Alva Neuer has said, in, for the cognitive, the embodied cognitive psychologists, perception and cognition is not something that happens to us or in us. It is something we do. And this emphasis upon doing as a starting point for psychological analysis, the study of perception or memory or of learning, which is central to uh, embodied cognitive psychology, has made the study of kinesthesia central. That is, this the whole direction of embodied cognitive psychology has placed a premium on the understanding of what the contribution of a sense of movement is uh, in our actions. And you can see the, 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 the beliefs behind this in, embodied in a quotation from John Dewey at the end of the 19th century. Dewey wrote, I believe that the active side precedes the passive in the development of the child nature, that expression comes before conscious impression, that the muscular development precedes the sensory, that movements, this is of course crucial for my argument, that movements come before conscious sensations. Hence, if movements come first, then it is the sense of movement uh, which appears to have uh, psychological, developmental, and epistemological primacy in how we learn about the world. And, and I want to say that that way of thinking has a long history, uh, but it has a, a, a living present in uh, the very uh, live debates in uh, embodied cognitivism. Now, what I find, one of the things that I find very interesting about this is that the embodied cognitivist arguments relate a lot to what might be called common sense, to the ordinary person's understanding, an ordinary person, person's awareness. We all know that children and animals move and learn through movement. And that the, the movement seems in many ways to be fundamental, uh, basic to the whole process uh, of, of, of children's and animals' lives. And we also live in a culture which is attributes to sport, and to the movement arts, and to therapies, uh, a, a gives a very great place to movement in ordinary people's lives. This is well understood. Um, and th this is the world of, in which people are so concerned with the nature of embodiment. And as I've tried to say, this, this culture makes it, uh, makes of interest, uh, gives great interest to the 
the sense of movement to understanding its nature. Though this is poorly developed in the literature, that though people talk about movement, its relation to a specific sense of movement is, is not well appreciated. And I want to say also that this concern with embodiment is very important to the contemporary environmentalist culture concerned with human ecology, the concern with our relationship to what is around us, to the landscape, the cityscape, to design, and to the difference between online and offline meetings, and the difference between uh, recorded performance and real live performance. If we are going to these questions, why uh, do children and animals love to move? Why is there such an emphasis upon embodiment in sport, the arts and therapies? And, and in the understanding of our rethinking of our relationships with the world around us, then the sense of movement um, has must have great prominence. Let me shift. I'm, I'm concluding my talk, uh, and I hope that there will be a stimulus here for discussion. If anybody needs reminding about the importance of the sense of movement, I, I give you this picture. Uh, of, of my Russian friend Natasha and her son Danya exploring the sense of movement. Here is another example of the sense of movement in action. This is a, a Swiss performer, uh, Fufwa le, le Immobilité. And Fufwa uh, has toured the world giving uh, um, st street performances in which he dances, uh, followed by those who will follow him on the streets of different cities around the world. Uh, and what he's doing is expressing the relationship between, between a person and the environment through the person's moving relationship, constantly changing the environment. And here is Fufwa in a uh, underground passage in Moscow uh, with me in the background. Um, we danced with Fufwa for several kilometers through Moscow to the amazement of Russian citizens. Uh, and you can see the political implications of this, I think, clearly, that this is a form of reclaiming the streets, the people. Here is the cover of my book, The Sense of Movement in Intellectual History. Uh, and it's interesting, to, how do, it's easy enough to picture movement, how do you picture a sense of movement? And here I've uh, pictured, uh, it, it's my own legs. Um, perhaps it's a first for an author to have their own legs on the cover of the book. Um, but the um, first, the, the feet are naked in contact with the ground. I'm standing on my own two feet. I'm in touch with the ground. I'm in balance uh, and you can see the metaphors of, of the, this sense of movement is making claims about what is real. Let me turn to another example of movement. This is a very famous Russian Pendia Repin of the Bulaki, the barge haulers on the Volga. These are the Volga boatmen. These are gangs of um, down and outs of the homeless and of the drunks, the poor, who earned money by hauling barges on, on the river. Uh, men, and there were women brigades also, uh, did this because 
they were cheaper than horses. Uh, and you can see that it, here, the nature of movement is at the center of a, an act of social commentary. Uh, and, and, and here am I uh, performing uh, after Repin uh, my party piece, uh, a, a little, a very short piece to music of the Volga boatman uh, of, of barge hauling. Uh, now, I, this is my very brief conclusion, and I, I hope that what I've said will stimulate some discussion. Um, and, and there are two aspects to this conclusion. That the attribution of a meaning to being embodied, to being in our own body, to talk meaningfully about having a body depends upon kinesthesia, depends upon the awareness we have of the position of our body and its movements. This I take to be fundamental. And the second is a, a, um, a talk is directed at everybody who's listening because you've been sitting through a conference uh, and sitting through a long conference is very demanding. And so I offer you this quotation from Nietzsche, sit as little as possible, give no evidence to any thought that was not born while one moved about freely, in which the muscles are not celebrating a feast too. That is, we have here a claim that in order to think clearly, uh, you should dance. And the dancer is a central symbol for Nietzsche of the figure who, through the movements of the body, expresses the freedom of the spirit. And with this thought that by ending my talk, you will be able to get up and move, I end my talk. Thank you very much. Just a second. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, uh, it's been a beautiful, delightful talk. Um, in fact, the word feast was in my mind uh, when I was uh, just trying to come up with a way to describe your talk. And the came in your uh, final quotation of Nietzsche. I was, by the way, uh, considering asking you about the role that Nietzsche might have had in your uh, concerns about um, the body and the sense of movement. Um, so I, I guess you answered that as well. Um, let's see if our audience has questions for you, okay? Uh, but it's going to be in Spanish, so I will translate uh, the question for you afterwards, okay? 
question in the audience from our expert in the history of primatology uh, here. And uh, the question is something like this, if I can translate it correctly. Are you aware of any uh, reflections on the role of movement and the body in interspecies uh, relationships? Um, uh, he's thinking in particular about a word by Despray um, entitled The Body We Care For, or maybe some other uh, historical reflections on the interspecies dimension of your uh, concern about the body that you might come up with. Uh, your mic. I'm asking you to reactivate. Okay. There we go. I, I apologies, taking time to find it. Um, th this is a interesting question for me, which I think I can't really answer. Um, th 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 because uh, the literature on uh, uh, the sense of movement comes out of the tradition of phenomenology. Uh, it's obviously a literature about human beings. Uh, and I think that the phenomenologists have paid very little attention to what might be comparable situation in, in other species. And this is, of course, understandable because we face the, the, the ever present question of what we can say about the conscious awareness of non human species. Um, but presumably, uh, analogous to uh, other senses, we should attribute some awareness of movement to, to animals. But I, I, I haven't read a literature in which this is done um, or discussed. Um, so I, I really don't know how to respond to the question. Um, what we can, can talk about is the importance of our moving relations with animals. And of course, that is another matter uh, that People have been aware of relations with the horse, for example, would be the most obvious, perhaps, of a, a relationship with a moving animal. Uh, uh, but I, I, if there is a literature about, say, about the rider's sense of relationship of the horse with the horse through movement, I, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, um, what I've looked at is. Um, movers relationship to physical things because I particularly have been interested in climbing so it's the movers the climbers relationship to rock um, and I, I haven't and this is very interesting and perhaps I should think about this uh, thought about the movers relationship to a living moving animal and the horse would be the, the, the most obvious and most interesting Thank you. Más preguntas, alguna otra? There is a question I I was um, waiting to have the opportunity to to ask you. There, there were many of them indeed, but um, there is one I can't um, help but asking you, and it's a question you asked yourself at the beginning of your, uh, of your talk, um, why does movement matter? And I, um, I have had the impression that perhaps the best way to summarize your answer 
to that question would be the picture of your Russian friend with her son. Um, but I wondered if you might be so kind as to try to put that answer in words for us. Yes, I, 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 this question I, I have thought about, and, and the challenge is not to answer it, but to answer it in a way that doesn't sound extremely vague, even pompous. And because the short answer is that movement is life. Uh, and if, if, for example, if, if, if you come across something lying in the road and you want to say, well, is it alive? You try and make it move. And you decide on whether something is alive or dead, on whether it has movement or doesn't have movement. And of course, with, with a human being, death is marked by the end of movement, of breath and of the heart. Uh, that is, there is the, the, the why movement matters is that it is not just uh, the symbol of life, but it is life itself. That is, if we are to characterize something as living, we cannot do it independently or separately from the, uh, if we're, we're talking about we're talking about animals uh, from the animals' movement, and and I think that is embedded in everyday popular consciousness, and it's Western, but I don't think it's just Western. Whether it's universal, I don't want to say, but it is extremely widespread uh, to. to uh, for example, in, in ancient medicine, the, the, the techniques of feeling the pulse uh, are, are embedded from very early on in our understanding of, of, of judging the quality of a life. So I would approach it from that direction. And, and if you look at the literature of uh, the, the so-called philosophies of life, Nietzsche, uh, followed by Bergson and others of that generation, uh, there is a very great emphasis on, on, on uh, the sense of movement uh, and on the sense of movement as uh, embodying, the, well, in the wider culture, it's taken to embody the life of the spirit. Um, that's a beautiful way to to answer uh, your own question in fact uh, when you were showing us the allegory of touch in the prado museum in madrid um it came to my mind that i think you might find it interesting uh, of course you probably know uh, there's a linguistic fact about uh paintings about, uh, about art um, in Spanish, which I think you might find interested if you're not familiar with it. Um, what you call a still life in English, we call naturaleza muerta, which means a dead life or a dead nature rather than a still life. Hmm. Um, so this connection between um, movement and life that you just mentioned is built into the term in Spanish for still life, which we uh, directly say it's dead nature. Yeah, th 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 this is very interesting, yes. Um, I, th the still, still life in English is very interesting because it um, contrasts what I've said, uh, opposites, stillness and uh, life. In, 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 the, in the Prado picture, uh, I pictured, I described as opposed. But of course, still life is a special genre which overcomes that by re restores life to, to life, uh, what is dead um, through the picture. The picture is itself a living thing, so to speak, um, as I would interpret it. But I like your example, yes. Mm.
Thank you once again, Roger. It's been a long day here in, in Madrid. Uh, we've I, been I, I imagine. Uh, I, since nine in the morning. So <laughs> I think most people is, uh, would be happy to take your advice and move um, a little bit. <laughs> So um, I want to thank you once again for closing our 34th symposium and ask our audience for a big hand uh, for you. Uh, thank you so much and we'll be in touch. Well, thank you so much. Thank you again. I'm going to end the meeting now. Right. We'll, we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Mm -hmm. Bueno. Muchas gracias. Bueno. Bueno. Eh, el programa dice que Gaby y yo tenemos que decir ahora unas palabras para clausurar la, 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 el simposio. Eh, uy, mira quién aparece por aquí. <laughs> segundos bueno eh, no queremos teneros aquí mucho más tiempo creo que ha sido demasiado ya tres largos pero jugosos días de, de encuentro y de, y de trabajo eh, así que aparte de dar las gracias a todas las personas que han estado involucradas en que esto fuera, fuera posible Gaby las mencionó ayer anoche en, en la cena y lo voy a hacer muy rápidamente para no eh, entreteneros más, Elena, Nuria, Sonia, Miguel Ángel, Ana, eh, también Víctor, Martín, Cristina, Silvia, que está ahora mismo aquí, los alumnos que nos han ayudado, los miembros del comité científico, Mónica Valtondre, Gonzalo Salas, René, Van Hechewitz, propio Gabriel, María Peñaranda, María Sinatra, que finalmente no, no pudo asistir, los moderadores de las mesas, Noemí, Pizarroso, Silvia Levy, María José Monteagudo, eh, José Carlos Loreo y Fernando Gabucio, la maravillosa Ana María Jacobi Lela, eh, que nos ha acompañado todos, todos estos días, y todos vosotros. Eh, muchas, muchas gracias a todos. Eh, os voy a pedir un minuto solamente para contaros una historia sobre eh, el lugar en el que estamos. Eh, la historia de ese hombre al que, al que estáis viendo, que se llamaba Ramón Francisco Aparicio Pérez y nació en Cienpozuelos en 1892. Consiguió ser titular de la Escuela Unitaria de Niños número 2 de Arganda y allí empezó a desarrollar los principios de la escuela activa, una, un movimiento de renovación pedagógica eh, para formarse en el cual consiguió una, una pensión, una beca de la Junta de Ampliación de Estudios y viajó a Bélgica para estudiar con, con De Croly. Introdujo en la Escuela de Arganda la coeducación, introdujo las actividades extraescolares, agrimensura, una instalación pluviométrica, eh, en fin, eh, cosas eh, verdaderamente emocionantes. Eh, recibió un premio por, eh, que le otorgó la revista El Magisterio Español por la renovación de las prácticas educativas que estaba llevando a cabo desde esa escuela número dos de Arganda. Eh, también puso en marcha una campaña contra el analfabetismo eh, en, en los pueblos, en los alrededores de, de Arganda, muy cerquita de Madrid. Eh, estaba ligado al Partido Republicano Radical Socialista, muy cercano a la institución libre de enseñanza. Eh, cuando terminó la guerra, este maestro, como tantos otros, fue encarcelado en eh, la cárcel de Porrier. 
Esto es la cárcel de Porlier. Si miráis a vuestra derecha, el patio que veréis bajo la lluvia es el mismo patio que veis en la fotografía eh, lleno de presos eh, republicanos. Me parecía que hacía falta que, que lo supierais. El autor del cartel del simposio que firma como, no sé si se llega a ver debajo, como el embajador, es el nieto de Román Aparicio Pérez. Eh, hace muchos años, eh, un día con la madre de él, la hija de Román Aparicio, eh, ella, doña Concha, me enseñó una carta que Román, su marido, eh, su padre, perdón, le había escrito a su madre desde la cárcel de Porlier. Si queréis al salir podéis eh, pasar un poquito a la derecha y ver la escalera. En esa, en esa carta le contaba a su esposa que eran tantos ya los presos que había aquí que se habían habilitado los peldaños de la escalera como camas. Cada preso dormía en un peldaño de, de esta escalera. Llevo 20 años dando clase aquí y esa, ese fantasma, esa sombra de los presos durmiendo en los peldaños de la escalera, os imagináis que me ha acompañado cada día que he subido la escalera, ¿no? eh, es una eh, forma un poco sombría de eh, terminar nuestro encuentro, que ha sido todo lo contrario, luminoso, alegre, jovial, después de tanto tiempo sin vernos, pero me parecía también que era un homenaje necesario a tantos hombres, esto era la prisión provincial de hombres número uno que salieron directamente de este patio a las tapias de los cementerios en los que eran fusilados. Reitero el agradecimiento, eh, ahora más emocionado que hace unos minutos, a, a todos vosotros y le dejo la palabra a nuestro presidente para clausurar este 34 simposio. Todo me dice que lo único que puedo hacer es estropear aquí. ¿Qué, ¿Qué es la historia sin un ejercicio de memoria? ¿Y qué es la buena historia sin un buen ejercicio de memoria? Muchas gracias a todos los que habéis hecho posible el que volvamos a encontrarnos eh, personalmente y el que volvamos a vivir realmente y esperemos que el año que viene esto se repita. Cardenal Cisneros, en marcha.